Okay, so today we're going to start off in the middle of chapter 5. Last time uh, we started chapter 5, and chapter 5, again, is all about potential step methods. And potential step methods, as I said, is very crucial to understanding potential sweep methods, which is what we tend to do in our lab. Uh, because potential sweep is very difficult to understand, and potential step is at least a little bit more understandable. Um, all right, so now we're going to talk um, today about the stuff that we like a lot. Um, we're going to talk about ultramicrometric. Now, we rarely use the term ultra microelectrode in our lab. I'm not exactly sure. I think this is like a historical thing. If somebody had an electrode, they were probably calling the microelectrode, and somebody came up with something that was on like the, you know, and that was probably like hundreds of microns or something, right? And then somebody else came up with something that's like the seven micron scale, and they called it their ultra microelectrode. In fact, I know saw a postdoc who wrote a grant once and got ridiculed by the other people for calling it an ultra microelectrode. Like, well, there's nothing ultra about this. And God's like, well, that's the same with terminology. It's like, you know, like, what are they ripping me for? Um, uh, so, I mean, an ultra microelectrode is a microelectrode. There's no real difference. We usually leave, leave off the ultra, but I think it's still there in the textbook. Um, and so the definition, again, uh, from the historical perspective, is an electrode with one dimension that's less than the diffusion layer. And so generally, an ultra microelectrode is less than about 25, maybe 30 something like that. That's the definition that I'm really going to use. And there's lots of types of um, ultra microelectrodes. We don't have, we don't use them all in our lab. All right, there's the disk. By the way, electric chemistry is always called the K. I don't like the CCs. I mean, I don't know why. It just it is spelled with a K, not a C. Um, uh, I occasionally see people spell with a C. Right? So there's a disc electrode right where it's at the uh, where it's a disc at the end. We do some of those spherical electrodes. Sometimes what they'll do for a spherical electrode, right, is use some like drop of gold or like a nanoparticle or something like that. So you say, how do I make a spherical electrode? Um, that's the answer. Um, lots of historical work was done with that dropping mercury electrode. And so that ends up being a hemisphere. It would really be like this, and the mercury would drop off of it. Uh, and it would drop at a certain rate, and then the electrode would go away. And they loved this because you got an electrode every once in a while. You could do all your electric chemistry. So you didn't care about power and stuff like that. So you'll see lots and lots of stuff about dropping mercury electrodes in textbooks. Oh, I don't know one that doesn't want to go today. Um, uh, but they're kind of the historical ones. You can have band, ultra-microelectrodes. So these are what they sound like, little bands, oftentimes with an array, something like that. So this is the kind of stuff you might fabricate like on a chip or something like that. Um, uh, and then we especially know and love the cylindrical ultra-microelectrode that we talked about yesterday. Uh, with uh, sort of deep subdiffusion, we'll do some more today. Uh, you know, where it kind of sticks out. So, um, these are ultra-microelectrodes. You know, now things have gone, as I said, sub-micron, people can go to nano-electrodes and all of that, so we probably won't call them ultra very much. Uh, but microelectrodes, they are. Um, all right, so last time we said if we had a disk that we did not have linear diffusion, right, but that we had extra stuff, right, that got to it kind of coming in from the sides. And again, I said if you looked up in the textbook, you could find some equations that would govern how to, you know, solve fancy differential equations to solve all of this. Um, and so if you were to do that, usually, I want to give you one thing for a disk, though. I've been drawing them, and I want to draw them like this. Lots of times with a disk, the, the disk actually looks like this, where this is an insulator, right, and this is the actual disk of some radius r. So if you start to really, like, delve into the textbook, sometimes they'll have r minus this kind of things because if you get a huge amount of insulation, you can turn the disk into like a 
linear again. Like, you know, so the, the radius of the insulation matters. That's the last element to mention it. Uh, but, you know, if it's, if it's, you know, three orders of magnitude bigger than your tiny little disk, then your disk is not going to see the stuff, you know, off to the side. But let's consider something where our, the radius of the insulation is small. So we still have this um, hemispherical diffusion. Um, and so you can solve for i, and it turns out, oh, okay, I'll write it over here. It's a function of some dimensionalist time parameter, tau is equal. R zero squared. So this is a dimensionless time. So the function of time, right? And we talked about that before, especially with the sphere, which you kind of grow um, in time. But I told you, if you ever want to do diffusion to anything, you should choose the disk. Because it turns out after a while, you can actually get a steady state concentration out of a disk. That where it's sampling from can be replenished from the outside world. And you can actually end up getting a steady state concentration that isn't going to have time in there. Um, and so the time, um, sort of, you, you, again, what you want is to find the limit to those two infinity of what that is. And if you do that, we'll just solve. That's the equation. It's, it's nothing underneath it. It always gets me. Um, or in F -R, or in F D C R. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to write this one up there is because A is the fundamental parameter, but because we end up with a pi R there, right? A in this case it's just pi R squared, right? So you see how the pi R kind of drops out, and that just leaves you with R. So it's the steady state current in this depends on the radius of the disk, um, and so theoretically. If you know the concentration and you know the diffusion coefficient, if you know the number of electrons, you can use this to tell the size of your electron. We've tried sometimes in our lab, it's more problematic than it seems, but people, this is what people do. I mean, you can, there is a steady state concentration that you should get. If you did chrono ray barometry, then you just step to a step, you should be able to pull out the radius, the effective radius of your electron. Now again, it may not exactly be the geometric radius because it's rough. Remember, we ended on yesterday talking about there's an actual area due to roughness and a geometric area due to the calculations. So, um, uh, but this is this is the method, you know, with like a disk microelectrode. This is how you would pull out and figure out how big your electrode is. Some people actually do that. Um, so that equation is pretty useful. Um, uh, to, to, know, to, to know where it is. Unfortunately for the cylinder, as much as we love it, you can't write a steady state equation like I just did. So the best you can do is write an equation ends up being this 2NFA DC over R0 times the natural log of tau. So I can't get that time dependence out of there. The depletion layer just grows and grows and grows. So nobody really um, likes this. And so you never get a true steady state current. Doesn't mean that it won't level off. It's hard to get a steady state current. Thus, there is no take your cylinder, go measure the area kind of thought. Uh, a few people's heads, like there are for the, um, uh, for the um, disc. Okay, so that's kind of microelectrodes, and this is where they finally get to them in the book. Um, in fact, if you read the preface to the book, um, it's kind of like an introduction or something, they talk about the things that developed between 1980 and 2008 or something when they actually read the book. They've been doing it for like 20 years. Um, and you know, microelectrodes is one of those things that, you know, that basically didn't exist in 1980 or not in the shape, you know, that they do like in later times. 
Uh, so they tried to add some of that back in. All right, so moving on. We're going to go back for a minute to the idea of sample multiple So we did this yesterday, uh, where we talked about the fact that if we wanted to step, we could step one step, two step, three step, four step, five step, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. we could get a curve of i versus a function of the potential we step to. Okay, and we also said, hint, hint, this is our predecessor to uh, cyclical geometry, um, only in stepwise fashion. Um, so we're going to go back there. Um, and look at what we should be getting. So if we're stepping to different potentials, uh, it turns out we can write a slightly weird, it's going to look like the, the um, nurse equation is like it's gone. Um, so we can get out, oh, I'm going to So remember if we did this, we could get out and we stirred, right? We got out. All right, um, we would get out something that looked like this uh, for our I versus um, voltage curve. And from this, we haven't really talked about it too much yet. We haven't, um, they, rarely do they, um, the, the parameter that people usually measure is called E1 half. So E1 half is where you get the half of the limiting current. So we were going to look at what's I over here, right? If this is I sub L, the limiting current, this is I sub L over G. All right, so when I hit half the limiting current, that's E1 half. Uh, so we haven't really dealt with E1 half. One of the problems with electric chemistry is you have that standard potential, and then we say, oh, we don't like that, we'll use the formal potential, and then we say, oh, we don't like that, we'll use the halfway potential. And, you know, you can understand why everybody gets confused. Because they're all about the same thing, but they're not quite equal. Um, darn it. Um, you know, uh, so uh, that's what we have to kind of look at. Um, all right, so E1 half, then, is going to be equal to the formal potential plus, again, it almost looks like the Nernst equation, but it's not. Um, ends up being the diffusion equation, diffusion coefficient for R to the 1 half over the diffusion coefficient of O to the 1 half. Um, and so if dr is approximately equal to d0, right, if the diffusion coefficients of your two species are approximately the same, right, then you'll end up getting that e1 half is approximately equal to e0. Good, fine, so the formal potential. So again, you know, it's kind of like, as if we're always kind of making some approximation. So this is an approximation of approximation, which is another approximation, but, you know, go with it. Um, so that's what people like to do with um, E1 half. Turns out that, that this equation uh, that I just wrote up there is for linear diffusion. And at the form of this equation, this might differ. In fact, it does differ. Let's not say might. We don't mean it. It does differ with other diffusion forms. So just to, you know, come confuse things up to a lot of things. If you had spherical diffusion or other things, they give some other equations in the textbook. So it all depends on what diffusion you have. But basically, if it, all of them come out to the same approximation. As long as dr is approximately do, e would have is approximately the form of potential. Um, uh, and so we've looked at that. OK, so let's look at this plateau for a minute. Um, so. Right, so I said we were going to, you know, take our points, right, this was sample voltammetry, so I would have pointed them because I like that better. Um, uh, um, so we look at the plateau. What affects the plateau? This is a good review question. All right, so the plateau, right, is just a limiting current. So what are some of the things that are going to affect the limiting current? Surface area. Surface area, right? So right, if I have a bigger electrode, I'll get more. There's lots of answers. 
I'm going to make you participate more today. Yeah. All we've learned about reaction kinetics, I'll put it there. Because I showed you all the Arrhenia scenes. It's not the biggest factor. I'm looking for some other things that might come out. Oh, concentration. Concentration, that's a great one. There's one more big one. That's in like every equation that we do. Yeah, diffusion is going to play a role, so we'll, we'll look at diffusion coefficient. Because it is diffusion limited. We'll put that in there. Probably the last one for. Time. Not time in this case. We're at a steady state because we're going to start. I is equal to starting equation. What do they all start with? I is equal to, all right, forget the constant. Yes. N, F, A, right? So what one have we done? N. <laughs> right, I mean, again, I'm not trying to, I'm going to say this later, but I don't want you to be able to spew tons of equations. But you have to intrinsically know. It, like, it's sort of weird when you teach this stuff, because it's like, the ability just to spew an equation will not pass your morals. Like, you have to have an understanding of it. But you also, you know, and so, and they are fairly forgiving if you don't quite get the whole thing in the exact right form on the board, you know, if, especially if it's complicated. On the other hand, though, you have to know the variables that are there. You know, you have to know what's going into it. So, again, number of electrons. And so you have to start, I'm trying to drill into you, you know, I is equal to NFA is like an every equation, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, they all start that way. There's other things in them, but they all start that way. So, you know, when you're starting to try to guess what affects my current, you know, and you're starting to go down this line of some question somebody's asking you, you know, start this, you know, start, start there. Uh, it's not a bad place to go. Okay, so, you know, when people do this type of an experiment, and again, we'll get to chapter six where we'll, they will call it a sweep and we'll see the same exact thing, but it's the same thing. Um, uh, right, they're trying to find I, and most of the time when people do this, they're trying to determine I. They'll know the area of the electrode, they'll know N, et etc. et cetera. But you can look at any of those variables um, and look at them. Okay, so let's look at reversibility.
we do our sample voltammetry wave, that was a terrible one. I'll try again. If I do it in a different color, I'll do it better. All right, that's at least better. You'll often see people talk about the slope, the wave slope, right? Like, what's the slope of that rise? And so it's, it's reversible. The slope of that rise is 2.303. Again, this just comes from going from log to natural log, so don't worry about that. RT um, over NF. And because you should know how to approximate at room temperature, so at about 25C, right? Remember, if you were to really do this equation right, you would put T and K. In Kelvin, right? Any time you saw the peak of equation, right, you had to, you know, add 273. So you would do that. But at room temperature, whatever that is, 298 Kelvin, right, this evaluates to 59 millivolts over N. And that's a number worth Because we'll see it again. Uh, so 59 millivolts. And so when people talk about things being nurse the end, they'll say, like, the wave slope is 58 millivolts, no, you know, 58 millivolts, so congratulate themselves for getting close to no, knowing it's nurse the end, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but N is the number of electrons, right? So if you had a two electron process, right, then your wave slope is at 59, right? It's 30. So the number of electrons does affect the slope, but um, you'll see people all the time, they almost always compare to 59. So you got to know it's 59. Um, uh, because that's what people will refer to all the time. Like, it's Nernstein. I got the answer 58. And they just think you know that the answer was supposed to be 59, so they, they did a really good job. Um, uh, you know, as you kind of read along in the paper. Okay, so that's our Nernstein reaction. Unfortunately, uh, sorry.